Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very, very thankful for who you are and all you've done for us. I thank you, dear Lord, for all of the contrasts that you show us between Christ and self. I pray that you would have us grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to spend just a few minutes going over uh, some of the basics. Uh, years ago, the Roman church was was basically the choice. Uh, uh, it was the church of choice in the Roman church, uh, among other things. Uh, and I'm not going to spend any time on the blasphemy of a bloody mass or some of the other foolishness, but, but two of the main points of the Roman church were Scripture plus the church, Scripture plus tradition, in the church and the, and the finished work of Christ plus works and out of that uh, faithful men God raised up some faithful men who spent time in the scriptures and so came the Reformation and in the Reformation there was the strong scripture only faith only and uh, in that faith based in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, not the faithfulness of any human. And that was the strong point out of the Reformation. Scripture only, the finished work of Christ only, and where are we today? Well, Scriptures are not very trustworthy. In fact, I, we we're not even sure if it's what we're reading is the Word of God. And sacred Christian texts are under attack from not just believers, but scholars today. Uh, in this modern age, this, pop, this modern culture that we live in, scholars disagree about the authenticity of some of Scripture. And then there are those who, who well, there's those who treat it very casually. They they don't they really believe that this is God is inspired word, but they 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 approach these verses and they don't really spend a lot of time in these verses. And one of my emphasis the, the biggest things that I've tried to emphasize in this ministry is how that you need to spend time in this book and not just agree with me on what I say or what I think some passage of scripture means. Uh, there are many, many pastors today who actually, if you can believe it, or, you know, it's hard to believe, they actually question the deity of Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm talking about even those who stand for the truth of God's Word. There are some who profess to be Christian uh, that, uh, well, they're, they're just not sure. Christ really died. He really rose again. And, and uh, But, well, maybe Judas was mistaken. He was maybe Judas that was mistakenly uh, was crucified. You know, he was crucified by mistake. And what came out of Christianity was really a noble lie. You know, that's helped a lot of people, you know, in the way that they live. But fundamentally, it's not true. And then we get to uh, to more basic things, such as wives being subject to their husbands. I'm not sure if that has anything to do with uh, the uh, Blessed Hope Forever's own analytics, where that uh, twice as many men than, than women will actually watch these videos. But that aside, our attention needs to be on Christ and not ourselves, and that is a such a basic basic truth that we sometimes or many times I, f I think in fact we we don't even realize what we're doing when we're going through this book and we're looking and we're reading these verses and we're we're putting ourselves in front of Christ if you follow kind of follow what I'm saying 
Uh, I don't think that we should do that. You know, in years past, I'm, I'm getting older now. In, in my earlier years, I'd, I'd actually counsel young couples who were uh, getting married or, or who were married. And every once in a while, there's that one girl, you know, don't bring up anything about subjection to the husband. And I'd say, then don't get married. I mean, I'm as blunt as I can be. Don't get married. And many a marriage is falling apart because of treating the Word of God lightly. Husbands, love your wives. Well, I'd, I'd love her if she'd do something, but she's not lovable. You know, you just don't know this woman. You know, nobody can love this woman. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself forth that it shouldn't have spot or wrinkle. And I'm astounded at Christians who think the church has spots and wrinkles. You know, Christ didn't do enough. And then there's these, these pulpit-thumping evangelists, or whatever you call them, that have four sermons and no Bible intelligence who say that husbands are the head of the house when there's not a verse of Scripture that says that the man is the head of the house. The wife holds absolute authority over the house. I knew a, a young couple once that, uh, well, not too young, but they spent quite a, a bit of time with each other. Uh, but they were getting a divorce. And the man said, I don't understand why my wife wants a divorce. I mean, I love her dearly, but she wants to divorce. She, you know, and the woman said that she, well, he won't let me do anything. And and the guy says, you know, I, well, I don't understand that. I, I don't understand why my wife wants a divorce. I don't understand that. I, I do everything that she wants. She said she wanted a picture on the wall. I went and bought one. You know, she said that she wanted the house painted, so I painted it. You know, she said, it's more than that. Every Monday, he gives me a, a, a typewritten list for the menu of all the meals that we're going to eat that week, and he's the one that buys the groceries. I don't do anything. Dearly beloved, we are told by God's word that the man is the head of the wife, but the wife is the ruler, the absolute despot of the house. She wants a couch over there. That's that's where it goes. Okay, she wants the wall painted blue. It's it's going to be blue. But no, Paul. No, we know Paul. He didn't like women. He had something against women. He was sexist or, or whatever they call that. It's obvious that uh, that he was. Uh, I don't know, what, do you, what is the word? I can't even think of it. The... And so those verses, they don't really mean that. I have a, a very high view of Scripture. I may not understand much of this book, but this is God's Word, and it's Scripture only. It isn't your work, your ideas, your production. It, it, it is what this book says. And we come down to the fact that today no longer is it the faithfulness of Christ alone, okay? It's the faithfulness of Christ plus something from you. And so we've basically said goodbye to the Reformation. Much of the, the preaching that I hear on radio and TV is as Roman Catholic as it can be. It's faith plus works and it's scripture and it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's scripture plus the teaching of other people. Folks, there aren't any experts. We are people who are we're sinners, redeemed by grace. And that grace has to be the bedrock foundation when it comes to understanding these verses that we're looking at. We are not being honest with the text to say that when it says Christ is a propitiation for our sins, it must mean he's only the propitiation for the for the little sins, not you know, not the big ones. Or maybe propitiation really doesn't mean what the word means. So we change the meaning of the word. You know, if God is appeased, how can his wrath fall on me? It's interesting that there are uh, three passages of Scripture that speak about God's wrath falling on the children of disobedience. And I'm going to tell you, that's not you. You know, Ephesians 2.2, 2, 
Ephesians 5, 6, and Colossians 3, 6. And there are three verses that speak of Christ as a propitiation for sin. Romans 3, 25, uh, 1 John 2, 2, and 1 John 4, 10. It's interesting that God uh, pitted three against three here. Now, either I don't know what children of disobedience means, or I don't know what propitiation means, but clearly if we have a conflict in those verses, I have a duty to decide what they really mean. If the wrath of God falls on the children of disobedience, and those children of disobedience are Christians, then folks, then most of the Bible is not true. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. How many iniquities? Colossians 3, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory, in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, uh, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, uh, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, in which ye also at some time walked. That's not you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whoever hears my words and believes on him that sent me has everlasting, everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, not come into con condemnation, but has already passed from death to life. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law works wrath. For where there no law is, where there's no law, there's no transgression. Have you ever thought about that, folks? Did, did you know that you can't transgress? If you do, you must be under law. But the scriptures declare that you're not under law, but under grace. Now, is that true or is that not? If you're not under law, you can't break any law. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again because of our justification. Well, how many offenses did he deliver me from? Raised again for our justification. Therefore, being justified by the faithfulness of Christ, we have peace with God. That's what propitiation means. You either have peace with God or you don't. And every believer, every single believer, has peace with God. No, you are not a child of disobedience. You have from the heart obeyed the gospel because you are God's child. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Romans 6. We were once his enemies, but we are reconciled to God by the faithfulness of Christ. There are many verses that I look at, as, and I, I call them double these are verses that are double they're double sided koan verses okay i want you to take note of that of these in this video i think this will help understand uh this uh for by one man's disobedience the elect were made sinners so by the obedience of the one christ shall the elect be made righteous that that is a double sided koan okay and, and we're going to see some more of those. Now, how are you made righteous? Well, you gave up smoking. You know, you gave up playing poker with your friends on Saturday night. I don't, I don't know. Whatever. Right? You were made righteous by the obedience of Christ. If you were not made righteous by the obedience of Christ, you're not righteous. Okay? There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for whom... He did foreknow. He also did predestinate. There's that ugly word there. To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And if God is for us, who can be against us? 
Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall all be changed in a moment or the twinkling of an eye. So it must all happen at the same time. All of the dead shall be raised incorruptible. He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. If you know the grace of God, you know you're righteous. And you're not and you know you're not righteous because of the way that you live. You're righteous because of what Christ did. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father. If he's my father, He's the one by whom I was born. A man is, isn't justified by the works of the law, but by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And we could go on and on. Uh, there's so many verses here. And these are the basics, folks. Dearly beloved, if God's wrath falls on any one of you, okay, the book is not, this book is not the word of God. God's wrath fell on Christ. Okay, the life which I now live. You didn't get off scot-free, okay? You, the... God's wrath fell on Christ, and, and that was just, okay, in your case. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God, not my faithfulness. I don't, I don't live by my faithfulness, praise God. I live, this, I live this life by the faithfulness of Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. This only would I learn from you, of you received you the spirit of the works of the law or by the hearing of faith are you so foolish having begun by the spirit are you now being made perfect by the flesh okay god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in christ and put on the new man which is created in righteousness and true holiness he sanctified the church Cleansing it so that there's no spot and there's no wrinkle. And who, folks, who makes it? Who makes it without spot or wrinkle? Christ. Being confident of this very thing, that the one who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Who's going to complete it? You. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us fit... Meat, meat, says the King James, fit, okay, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You're all complete in Christ. Nothing more to be done. Even when we were dead in sins, hath, hath he quickened us together with Christ. Okay. When, folks, were you quickened with Christ? Before you committed a single sin. You were quickened with him. When you were identified with him in his death, burial, and his resurrection. You're dead, folks. You're dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ appears, you absolutely will appear with him in glory. These scriptures go on and on and on. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to run out of time. Uh, uh, let me ask you a question. Okay, you got three three married men, and they're all Christians. Every one of them, every one, every single, all three of these, every one of them, Christ died in their place. Okay, one's in bed with a prostitute. One works for a company, and and he just took fifty dollars out of petty cash, hoping nobody knows about it. Of course, he's his intent is to is to pay it someday, pay it back. And then there, here's this evangelist, really busy guy. He's saving souls. He's out preaching all the time. He's so he, In fact, he's so busy that he didn't have time to help my brother who was in need that he passed by. And Christ comes. Who does he take? Who does he take? How much... Do you understand God's grace? He leaves the guy in bed with a prostitute, but he takes the evangelist who didn't help a brother in need. I mean, which is the worst sin? Are they covered by Christ? Folks, you've got to decide what you really believe about the finished work of Jesus Christ. 
Are they all, all three of these men, are they all holy, unblameable, and unreprovable? Are they all new creations in Christ? When the dead come, come out of their graves, is he raising up the old man or the new man? Which one loves Christ the most? You know, I read that, I read that passage in Luke, and I can just see Simon. Simon, who do you believe loves me the most? And, and I, I would love to see this on, on the movie screen. I suppose he who has been forgiven the most. I don't know whether you believe that or not. Well, Steve, are you saying that we have there's no consequences for sin? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying if, if every one of those three is a new creation in Christ, uh, that uh, that they won't be caught in compromising situations. I, I can't say that. I'm saying that if 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 every one of those three is a new creation in Christ, I'll see them in glory. Of course, sin has consequences, but Dearly beloved, that sin can never, ever change who we are in Christ. I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, consequences for sin, I, th I would say us's sin was worse. And here you got an Israelite whose death is associated with touching the Ark of the Covenant. You know, if that oxen's going to stumble, well, man, we got to help God out because God is, we know God, he's powerless to, to carry out his own work. What, folks, what Uzzah proclaimed absolutely was that God needs help. Worst sin I can think of. No wonder God struck him dead. We cannot add a single thing to the finished work of Christ. The God I know doesn't need any help. Your relationship to God is not based on what you do, but on what Christ did. And right here in our study in chapter uh, 3, verse 3, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as Christ is pure. And a, and a huge percentage of the Christians you know think that that's something that they do. And I tell you, it is absolutely wrong to think that you can do anything to purify yourself. Okay? You purify yourself by realizing that it is Jesus Christ who covered all your sin. You can't carry a guilt of sin. If you carry a guilt of sin, you don't understand what Christ has done. He has perfected forever those whom he sanctified. You're complete in Him, and so therefore we're to comfort one another with these words. Verse 11, For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, verse 12, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. There's another double-sided Cohen verse. Okay, these are verses that I call double sided Cohen verses. All right, okay, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And why did he slew him? Slay him. Why did he do that? Because his own works were evil. That's one side of the Cohen, and his brother's righteous, not as Cain. And what most people do when they read that verse is, mo and I'm, just, I'm, I'm, tr I, uh, I would say in the main, what most people do when they read that is they immediately think, boy, man, Abel, boy, Abel was a good boy. He was a good boy. And Cain, he was a bad boy. Okay. That's what they think. And they don't think of Christ. They don't think of Christ. Most who are redeemed and who are going to heaven don't know what the gospel is. And that, that's amazing, okay, with all the study of God's Word that we have. But, but there is a terrible, terrible temptation to exalt man and to depress Christ, okay? Folks, we say Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Do you, do you understand what, the, what that is saying? 
You know, because even in Sunday school classes, even children will tell you, you know, Noah was different than everybody else. No, he wasn't. Noah's only thought was evil continually. Every man's thought was only evil continually. That included Noah. Okay? Noah found grace, grace in the eyes of the Lord because of Jesus Christ and his finished work. Abel was righteous. Okay? Let's go back to Noah. Again, with Noah, you see the double sided coin. Okay? Noah found grace. Look, I'm probably not doing a very good job of explaining it, but when, when we read that verse, our attention ought to be directed to Christ. And yet what we hear preached is if, you, if you'll receive him, you'll have the power to become the sons of God. That's not what this book says. This book says that those who received him were, were born not by their will, not by the will of the flesh, not by the will of man, but by God. They were born from above by God. Okay? That's not by faith in Christ, not by accepting Christ, not by making him Lord of their life. Okay? Not by having a personal relationship with him, not by confessing their sins, not by repenting. Nothing. They received him. Why? Because they were born from above, by the will of God. Apparently, Nicodemus, he didn't understand that. You must be born from above. We read that, and autom automatically we read into the text, well, that we've got to do something. And it, the text isn't saying that at all. It's the must of necessity. You know, the first thing that we ought to realize is you don't do anything to be born. Your father and your mother do something, but you don't do anything to be born. And we absolutely must be born again. I, it's the truth. That's the truth. But Jesus wasn't telling Nicodemus he had to do anything. Born from above. And that's, that, by the way, is a perfect passive, you know, the perfect tense, stressing the present reality of something that was done in past time it's a completed action, and it's stressing the present reality, the results that continue on into the present. The passive voice says, you didn't do it. So those who received him were born by God. It's based on the faithfulness of Christ. In order that the promise, the promise might be absolutely certain to all the seed. So, to which one of the seed is it not certain? How could any uh, conservative seminary or author, scholar, and, and I'm and folks, I'm on record with several declaring these truths, write me back, which they've written me back, which they have, and they say, well, we are absolutely convinced that one becomes spiritually alive when one believes. Now, show me the verse. And when I point to John 10, why don't you believe me? Because you're not my sheep, and yet... And there are literally millions of people arguing today that man is not totally depraved. You can't do that from the scriptures. He can't hear, he can't believe, he can't, he can't see. The only way that you can believe God is if you're a sheep. If you're not a sheep, you can't believe. Okay, you don't make people sheep, okay, by believing or getting them to believe. They were sheep when they were born. They live as sheep. They die as sheep. And we have, we've, uh, we have seen how and why all who are born of God do not commit sin. And we get down to, to Abel is righteous. And I plead with you folks, don't look at Abel. Abel wasn't good. God was gracious in Christ Jesus. Abel was righteous because of Jesus Christ. My attention in that verse does not go to Abel, okay? And neither should yours. That's my point. It goes to Christ. Uh, let me just try to get into the heart of what John is saying. 
1 John 2, 29. Remember that verse, okay? As we left the last chapter. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that does righteousness is born of him. Perfect tense. Completely born by him. Passive voice. They didn't do it. The reason they're doing righteousness is because they're already righteous, okay? And he stresses that in verse 7. Let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is already righteous because he's been born above by the will of God. I believe absolutely that that which is born of God not only does not commit sin, but it has no ability to. It can't. That's what the verse says. Why? Because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin. You know, I've asked Christians from time to time throughout my walk in the Lord, I've, I've said over the years, I've said, are you reckoning yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ? And they say, oh, I tried that, didn't work. You know, as if it's supposed to keep you from sinning. That's not the point of the verse. It didn't work because you're looking at you, not Christ. There's no work in reckoning something to be true. As by the disobedience of Adam, the elect were made sinners, even so by the obedience of Christ, the elect shall be made, made righteous. Double-sided coin, okay? All right, there's Cain and Abel, okay? You see, are you getting this? Same thing. Which one won't be righteous? Are we willing to take God at His word? 1 John 3.14 we know that we pass from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And you say, well, I don't love the brother. Well, no problem. You haven't passed from death unto life. And I'm, I'm just being as blunt as I can be. If you've passed from death unto life, you love the brethren. Don't tell me you don't love the brethren. You may not always act like it. But you love the brethren. He that hears and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation because he's already passed from death to life. Is that true of you? Do you believe this book? Do you believe God's word? Then what, what it says is, is you love the brethren, okay, and you do. There's no appeal in that text for the old man, all right? I see an old man and a new man. There, there's nothing in the text that says that the old man loves the old man of somebody else. Okay? But I am absolutely persuaded that those who are born of the Spirit, those who are God's children, love one another. The Word of God says that you're a new creation in Christ because you were born by God's will, not yours, and you love the brethren. It's the new creation that loves one another. Verse 15, he who hates his brother is a murderer. A murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You know, the new man's not a murderer. The new creation is created in righteousness and true holiness. You, you might not know that from what you see in your life, but he says you put off the old man, which is corrupt and deceitful, and you put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. Chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For I hate skipping ahead, but I, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. That's, there's another perfect passive, okay? A thousand sermons preached around the world. You know, if you overcome, it's because you were one of the good Christians. You know, how do you overcome? Well, you fight sin and you live a good life and you don't smoke, drink, dance, don't play cards, don't go uh, horseback riding on Sunday, whatever. You know, I hate to sound like Joe Biden, folks, but come on, man. You overcome the world because you're born by God. You're his child. I tried to stress the fact that Christ said, when the disciples said, teach us to pray, start out our Father. Okay? When you start the prayer, our Father, you're saying, I know that I was born from above by you. Okay? Of incorruptible seed. I'm yours. Look at the 18th verse of the 5th chapter. All right. 
We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. Touches him not. He touches us not because he can't touch the righteous new man, folks. You know, we had that in the ninth verse of the third chapter, and just about every Christian I know of is obsessed with the garbage and the sin, not only in their lives, but in the lives of, one of others, okay? Listen to me. Our Father did not begat children with sin, okay? Now, modern evangelical thought argues against that. I'm not going to argue over it. If you have been born from above by God's will, you don't sin. Your new man does not sin. And I am not preaching sinless perfection here. Okay? Your old man does nothing but sin. And it does a good job of it. You know, it does such a good job of it that you're convinced that God didn't do a good job when he borned you again. But he did. You bask in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You can say with Paul, it is not I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Romans chapter 7. The argument's not that, that it's not that you sin. I mean, of course the old man sins. But it's not you. It's, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. That's the point we need to understand. God did not make you less than righteous. Okay? The, the popular Christian opinion today is that we don't habitually sin. Okay, this, but this, this book says the new man cannot sin. Okay, and if what that says is we sin occasionally, well, then, well, when we get to heaven, I guess we'll sin occasionally. The new man, dearly beloved, has no power to, stand, to sin. You stand absolutely complete in him. You are complete in Christ, who is the head of all principality and power. He's working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. He's made you a new creation that is holy and righteous, a new man that's created in righteousness and true holiness. Why, folks, are, why are you blameless before God? Because you've given up sin and you, you live a good life? No. No. You are blameless before God because of what Christ did. Hebrews chapter 2. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. He's the one that initiated it. And he's the one that will finish it. You were born by incorruptible seed, by the word of God that lives and abides forever. You were born by God's word, not yours. And your attention should not be on what you do or what others ought to do, but on what Christ did. Your attention should not be on how good Abel was and how bad Cain was. Do you understand me? No, I, and I'm not asking anyone to agree with anything that I say. I just ask you to think about it. Your attention should not be, ever be, on what you do or what others ought to do, but on what Christ did, that he died for your sins. He was buried and rose again on the third day from the dead. That's the good news. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for all of your prayers. Uh, the doc gave me a clean bill of health. The headaches have subsided. Running on almost nearly two weeks now. I haven't had a serious migraine. And I just thank God for that. And I thank God for you. I love every one of you. I truly do. Until next time, stay safe. Rest in Him. And thanks for watching.